Almost 10 years ago, I was in Eastern Turkey. And as I sat quietly in a small cafe, an Iranian refugee, a young man, told me his story. He told me how he had taken to the streets with so many other young people after the presidential elections. These young people felt like their votes were stolen and they asked from the Green Movement to the president and to the world, where is my vote? The young man I talked to, let's call him Darius, he got arrested. And as he was sitting with his wrists behind his back, tied together with a plastic tie wrap, wondering what was going to happen to him from now on, a car rushed up and somebody pulled him inside. It turned out to be a good Samaritan, a woman who drove him home. But he knew very well that he couldn't stay at home and it wouldn't be long before the police would come and find him there. So he grabbed together some clothes, left behind his laptop and pulled an old phone from a drawer. He had friends from the family who had a small shed in the north of the country, in the middle of nowhere, where he could go. And so off he went. And as he arrived there in the countryside, he turned on a phone he hadn't used for months just to tell his parents that he had arrived okay. A few hours later, he was arrested right there. The police had tracked him right there to the middle of nowhere. Now, he spent months in prison, and it was only after spending those months in the notorious Evin prison in Tehran that he was let out on furlough for the Persian New Year called Nowruz, and he was able to escape to Turkey. And in Turkey, he still didn't feel safe because he had a profound sense that he was being tracked and traced, even on the other side of the border. Now, the Iranian people and the Green Movement really kicked off a series of uprisings of young people from Tunisia to Hong Kong, and we may still see more in the future. And it was then, during the Arab Spring, that people thought that giving young people a mobile phone and internet access would make democracy go viral. But it didn't. In fact, the opposite happened. Surveillance systems spread all over the world. And they were made in democracies. In Iran, it was Nokia Siemens Networks that was providing the monitoring equipment that could be used over the telecoms networks to spy on people and to find young demonstrators, activists and dissidents so that they could be dragged from their homes to the most horrible prison conditions. And perhaps these technologies were made with good intentions so that German or Finnish police could track criminals or suspects of crimes. But we have the rule of law here, and you cannot simply go after someone without a court order. But lawful intercept technologies in a country where the rule of law does not exist put people uh, out without any defense. In Azerbaijan, Khadija Ismailova, a very brave investigative journalist who is fighting corruption, was secretly taped in the most intimate circumstances in her bedroom. And these videos were then leaked in an attempt to silence and intimidate her. In Egypt, I spoke to activists who entered into a police station where they found printouts, piles of them, with all their messages collected, email by email, WhatsApp message by WhatsApp message. And in Tunisia, the regime of Ben Ali really used the country almost like a sandbox to test the most sophisticated espionage technologies, not only to track his citizens, but also to go into their emails and change the content in mid-air to implicate them. We see that some governments are willing to go very, very far to track down a single human rights defender. In the United Arab Emirates, an estimated million euros was spent on finding one human rights defender, Ahmed Mansour, 
By the way, I was, it was just revealed this week that former NSA intelligence officers were helping the authorities there to make that happen. And we have to ask ourselves whether Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist that was so brutally murdered by Saudi authorities, would have been found without surveillance systems that the Saudis used, bought in Israel, used against human rights defenders, including the women's rights activists who are still in prison, like Lujain Lato. And you may tell me, should we be surprised that dictators are going to repress people? And unfortunately, this is predictable. But what I find unacceptable is that they do so with tools that are made in our free societies and that the sales of these cyber arms still continue. So as we look critically at our own role in all of this, as the world becomes more and more connected, let us go a little bit deeper and let us try to understand the broad way in which technology impacts democracy, not only far from home, but also in our own societies. Hundreds of millions of people use Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and other social media platforms to access information. <clears throat> they no longer watch the eight o'clock news or read a newspaper, and they engage in debates about anything from entertainment to politics online. But these platforms were not designed with democracy in mind. In fact, except for anecdotal stories, we don't know what the impact of algorithms really are on our public debate. And the anecdotes that we do know are reason for great concern. When somebody recently would type in Ruth Bader Ginsburg in YouTube search, they would find all kinds of conspiracies about the US Supreme Court justice that her health concerns were fabricated or that there was some kind of um, secret agenda behind her well-being. And similarly, you may have heard of the terrible Parkland High shootings, and you may have seen the brave high school students that were speaking out against gun violence. Now imagine going online, <coughs> looking for Parkland High students, and finding on the top of the search results a clip that alleges that these students are lying and that they're being paid. This is all happening every day in mechanisms where conspiracies, clickbait and sensation rise to the top while more nuanced stories are going down. And I think that this is another reason to be very, very concerned. To have a peek of where this could all escalate to, let us look at China where the next generation of technologies is really at the doorsteps. A combination between artificial intelligence and machine learning and facial recognition software may make it impossible to ever be anonymous again. In China, a system of social credit is being developed where people's every move is either rewarded with points or points are de deducted. So for example, running a red light can get you a deduction of your points, or paying a loan back in time can get you benefits. And this almost sounds like a game, but it's real life, with real life consequences. If you have a low score, it may be harder to get an airplane, to travel abroad, or to do anything that you wish for which you need to provide some credibility. One million of the minorities uh, of the Uyghurs in East Turkestan are already living in a completely controlled environment. Modern day concentration camp type facilities that are entirely technology controlled. And similarly, Winnie the Pooh was a victim. It may sound funny, but actually because there's so much censorship, both because of machines, but also because of human interventions, People in China cannot openly talk about their president. And so some of them thought they could use a symbol to uh, personify him, and they thought of the green, or the, sorry, the yellow uh, fuzzy bear, Winnie the Pooh. And it didn't take long before he also uh, was censored out, that Winnie the Pooh was no longer uh, available as an image and would disappear even from personal messages. 
Typing in Tiananmen Square in a search engine in China will render zero results. Now, I believe, and I've always believed, that having been born in this country, in one of the most open, free societies in the world, comes with responsibilities. But when we look at the ongoing digital arms sale, or the gradual erosion of our democracies because of the way technology is used, I don't think we're doing enough. And so I would ask you to join me. If you're an engineer, to design for democracy. If you're a business person, to develop for democracy. If you're a politician like myself, to regulate for democracy. And if you're a citizen, to make conscious choices. I believe it is essential that we all rise and say it should be us that govern technology and not technology governing us. Thank you.